بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الناصح الأمين اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام والسنة All praise and thanks belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounty of Islam and the bounty of the sunnah ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله بإذن الله تعالى in these next few moments we would like to give some advice to both those who are married and to those who are single inshallah ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in his noble book وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مُوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah Ta'ala, he says what means, and verily from his signs, is that he has made from you wives, spouses. Naam, he has made from you spouses, so that you may live in a good manner with her so that you may live in a good manner with her. And has placed between the both of you love and mercy. And verily in that, there are signs for those who reflect, for people who reflect. In that, there are signs for people who reflect. In this ayah, we see many benefits, many lessons that we learn. From those lessons, as the ulama they point out, is that our spouses are from us. Meaning that our spouses are from our same species. And this has a great importance because there comes a question or there came a question that was posed to the ulama asking whether or not it was permissible to marry from the jinn whether it was permissible for a human being to marry a jinn. Nah. So the scholars, they said, no, it is not permissible for a human being to marry a jinn. And the dalil for this is that Allah Ta'ala, He says, خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا Allah Ta'ala says that He made yani, for you from yourselves wives, meaning from your same species, so that the humankind have to marry the humankind, jinn kind marry jinn kind. Now, so this is a benefit, something we learn from this particular ayah. Also, we learn from this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made, yani, the marriage is, is from His signs. That the marriage is from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He places between the spouses love. He places between the spouses love and mercy. And verily, in that, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and verily in that there are signs for people who reflect, for people who think and contemplate. Naam. And there are many, many more benefits, many, many more benefits that are contained in this ayah. These are just a few we wanted to highlight. وَعَنْ أَنَسْ بِنْ مَالِكْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَمِلَ اللَّهَ وَأَثْنَى عَلَيْهِ وَقَالَ لكني أنا أصلي وأنام وأصوم وأفطر وأتزوج النساء فمن رغب عن سنتي فليس مني حديث متفق عليه حديث متفق عليه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he has established that marriage is from his sunnah that to be married is from the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Islam is not a deen that promotes or that advocates people to live single. 
It's not a dean that advocates that an individual, he will live his life singly, but rather it is a dean that encourages marriage. So much so that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he heard about the statement of those men who had came, and one of them said, well, I will stand up at night and pray and I won't sleep. Another one said, and I will fast every day and I will continuously fast. Yeah. Another one said, I will not marry women. Then me, I will not marry women, and so on and so forth. So the Prophet Sallallahu when he heard about these statements of these individuals making claim that they would do the likes of these things, he informed them that I am a person who I fast, or I'm a person who I, I pray at night and I sleep. I pray and I sleep. Now, I fast and I break my fast, and I marry women. Now, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, and whoever desires other than my sunnah, he's not from me. Whoever desires other than my sunnah, he's looking for something else. He thinks there's another way, he is not from me. Naam. So we understand that marriage, naam, it is something that is tremendous. It is something that has in it a tremendous benefit for the Muslims. Also, due to the benefit that is contained therein, marriage is something that shouldn't be delayed. It shouldn't be delayed. If an individual has the ability to get married when they are young, then they should get married when they are young. And it's not something that should be delayed for other reasons. As Shaykh bin Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, fadilah to Shaykh al-Allama al-Imam, he explains in his majmur al fatawa in speaking about this particular issue, that marriage should not be delayed. Marriage shouldn't be delayed. Why? Because of the harms that are contained in not being married, especially in this day of ours in which we live in. The fitna is so much, there's such a multitude of fitna in this particular time that it is to an individual's detriment that he would delay marriage for whatever reason they, that they have from the reasons. But rather marriage is something that the youth, they should be encouraged to do. So as fathers, so as brothers yeah, and the like, we should be, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, those who are facilitating and making this affair easy for our children, for our brothers and our sisters, we should be making this affair easy. We shouldn't, in other words, we shouldn't be of those who make such extremely difficult conditions for the marriage. We shouldn't be of those who yani, are asking as fathers. We shouldn't be of those who are asking the grooms and requesting from them these outrageous dowries some which an individual will have to work for about five years or so just to gather what we're asking for. Now, we shouldn't be of those who make stipulations upon our children telling them that I don't want to hear nothing about marriage from you until you finish university. We shouldn't do this to them. Because I want, listen, we tell our children, right, and one, and one, and I'm talking to the fathers now specifically, in one breath, we tell our children, I want you to remain chaste. I want you to remain pious, okay? I don't want to hear nothing about no boyfriend, nothing about no girlfriend. I don't want to hear any of this nonsense. I want you to remain chaste, and I want you to remain pious. We tell them this in one breath. And then in another breath, we tell them, however, I don't want you to get married right now. I want you to finish university first. I want you to finish university. Now, and if you want to do grad school, maybe, maybe we can talk about it and negotiate at that point. But I want you to finish university first. And then they send them off to universities, and here in the West, that are what? That are mixed with the opposite sex, right? Some individuals are actually out of insanity, will send their children far away, far away to live to live on the campus, and so on and so forth, right? Setting them up, putting them in a situation that it makes them remaining chaste and pious is very difficult. It's very difficult to remain chaste in a situation like that. It's very difficult to hold on to what you need to hold on to and preserve what you need to preserve in a situation like that. So we set them up for loss, we set them up for loss while expecting them to succeed. So in one breath we tell them, remain chaste. In another, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another breath, what we encourage and we facilitate for them that which will destroy their chastity. Uh, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And then now when they fall into the evil, right? We act as if there's no blame upon ourselves. Now we are not part of the problem. When in essence we were the ones who were the designers of the problem. The Prophet he encouraged the youth to marry. 
as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith on Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal qala qala lana Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the Prophet or that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to us ya ma'shar al-shabab O assembly of youth O assembly of youth na'am the ulama they point out that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he pointed out the youth he specified the youth, although this address is applicable to the old as well. This address is also applicable to the old. But he pointed out the youth more specifically uh, for great wisdom. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, O assembly of youth, Naam, Man istafa'a minkum al ba'a falyatizawaj. Whoever from amongst you has the ability to marry, then let him marry. Whoever from amongst you has the ability to marry, then let him marry. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained some of the benefits of marriage. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَإِنَّهُ wa lil He said, because it is that which will enable you to lower your gaze more. It is that which will enable you to help you to better lower your gaze. And is that which is more safe. It is that which is better for you to protect your private parts. You'll be able to better protect your private parts when you're married. Naam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِيعُ And whoever cannot do it, whoever does not have the ability to do it, فَعَلَيْهِ بِصَوْمٍ Then it is for him to fast. فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَابٍ Because for him it will be or for that one who does not have the ability to marry, it will be for them that which would diminish uh, that appetite. It will be that which would diminish that desire. Now, we see from this hadith that the makhraj from the fitna of the opposite sex, that the exit and the yani from the fitna of the opposite sex, it comes from what? From marriage. It comes from, from marriage. Now, and this is an important point because there may be individuals who articulate a desire to get married. And before looking into the issue of whether or not they have the ability to get married, the first response is, well, just fast. Just fast. Ma'am. Especially when it comes to a man and he wants to take on a second or third or fourth wife. Right? As soon as it becomes clear that he's thinking about, considering, pondering, maybe, perhaps, the possibility of marrying another wife, what is usually the first response? Well, just fast. Did you fast? You've been fasting? How come you ain't fasting? Right? That's always the first response. But this is not the first makhraj. This is not the first way out from the fitna. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, whoever from amongst you can get married, then get married. Now, it's only in the event that you don't have the ability, then your deep, then your your fallback is what fasting. Then the fallback is fasting. Fasting is not what you go to first. It is what you go to once it has become clear that you do not have the ability. Then you fall back to fasting. Now, and it's something that is important because although we have, we find the wives saying this so often to the husbands, we also find the parents saying this to the children. We also find the parents telling the children this. Oh, you're thinking about marriage? Well, just fast. Without even looking into the situation to see whether or not it's even feasible. Because perhaps it's feasible. Perhaps it's possible that a child can get married. Perhaps. Perhaps there's a way. But without even thinking about that, without even contemplating and considering that, the default response becomes, well, just fast. Just fast. We need to fast more. We need to buy some dates, something, make you, make you add in some food, whatever. But we need to fast more. As opposed to looking and seeing whether or not it's even feasible, this is what we this is what we turn to. We should be looking and seeing whether or not it is feasible for the man and the like. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال and on the authority of Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه that the message that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said تنكح المرأة لأربعين that a woman is married for four reasons. A woman is married for four reasons. And these are for this is a, a, for those who are looking, actively seeking marriage. I want you to open up your ears now. 
The Prophet وسلم, he informed us that a woman is married for four reasons. That a woman is married either for her money, because of her wealth, or because of her status, or because of her beauty, or because of her deen. Or because of her deen. Now, so out of these four, which one should we be looking for now? Should it be the money? Marry the one who has money? Should it be because of the status or the family uh, lineage or the like? Should it be this because of the, the, the status of the family? Should it be because of the beauty? Or should it be because of the deen? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَضْفَرْ deen تَرِبَتْ yada." حَلِيثٌ مُتَفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ the Prophet Sallallahu he said, so seek the victory, يعني, seek the success by going after the one that has deen, going after the one that has good religion. نعم. And then he, he issued a warning for those who don't take this advice. He said, Tell about your dad, when your hands be covered in dust, meaning that for those who are not looking for the deen and looking for the money or looking for the, the lineage or the status of the family or the, or the beauty and the not, then may your hands be covered with dust, meaning may you be disgraced. The reason being is because the one who is wise, he will understand that the only one of these things that really has any substance to it is what? Is the deen. Because as far as money, how many billionaires go bankrupt? Now, the money may not last. How many trust fund children get cut off? Right? It happens. They get cut off. Now they have no more, no more line of money. So that's something that may not last. Huh? As far as the lineage and the status and things like this, how many people who are fluent today become the most disgraced tomorrow? These are things that there's no substance in it. As far as the beauty, we know beauty fades. We know as individuals we become accustomed to beauty. Looking at a flower that is beautiful, the first time you see it, it amazes you, right? This is the first time you ever seen a flower of this type, it amazes you. You love this flower. So now every day now you buy this flower, or every week, few times a week, you're buying these flowers, and they're adorning your kitchen table and so on and so forth, the flower you're so amazed with. We know what's gonna happen after a couple of weeks and so. The the, 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 the the flower, you look at the flower the same way you look at your table. You're no longer amazed with it. You become accustomed to its beauty. Sahwudinah. Now, same thing with the women. Now, you marry her, she's so beautiful. The when you have the, the initial sign, you see her, she's so gorgeous, so beautiful, so, so, so much, so much, so much. Okay, now, six months after being married, you look upon her, oh, that's just my wife. Sahwudinah. Same thing for the women. Now, the man is so handsome, mashallah, he's so handsome. After three, four, five, six months a year, oh, that's just my husband. Now, you become accustomed to the beauty, accustomed to the handsomeness and the like. So this is not something that lasts. And then we know people get old, right? People get wrinkles, right? And so on and so forth. We understand that beauty fades. Alukulihad. The only one that has substance is what? To marry for the deen. To marry for the deen. Now, when you marry an individual for the deen, it not only helps you fulfill the purpose for marriage, but it also helps you to have a better and a more stable marriage. It helps you to have a better marriage, a more stable marriage, a more healthy relationship, a more healthy marriage. And Allah Ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, and live with them in good. And live with your spouses in good. Naam. Live with them upon the what? Upon the taqwa, upon the bir. Because marriage is an institution by way in which each party, each, 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 yani, uh, uh, aspect or yani, each one in that situation should be helping the other get to Jannah. Right? The husband should be helping the wife, the wife should be helping the husband. They should be helping and aiding each other into getting to Jannah and helping and aiding each other into fleeing and running away from the hellfire. It should be a source of good, a source of a coon of one's eye. It should be a source of benefit. This is the, the purpose of marriage, to be a source of benefit to help you go to Jannah so that you help one another go to Jannah. That's the purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah ta'ala, he says, and cooperate with one another upon birr and taqwa, and do not cooperate with one another upon sin and transgression. So cooperate with one another upon what? Righteousness and piety. Cooperate with one another upon righteousness and piety. So the marriage should be that which by way in which you're helping one another to and cooperating one another upon righteousness and piety. And Allah Ta'ala, He prohibits us, He says, and do not cooperate 
upon sin and transgression. Now, so the marriage shouldn't be an institution by way in which we're cooperating upon sin and transgression. But it should be that which will help us to get to the Jannah. What will help us get to the Jannah? Cooperating upon righteousness and piety. Now, how would you better fulfill that objective of cooperating with your spouse upon righteousness and upon piety? It will be by marrying one that has good religion. Marrying one that is righteous. If you marry one that is righteous, then it will be easy for you. You will be helping yourself, bi ta'ala, into cooperating upon righteousness and piety. Now, and this is something that is tremendously important. Because you want to marry a spouse that will help you to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as spouses, we should be looking, na'am, we should be looking at our other halves, na'am, and making sure that they're giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights. We should be making sure that they're giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights. And we should be very diligent on reminding each other about the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to make sure that we're, 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 we're striving to help one another and to fulfill the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon us. Because for the one who is wise, the one who is intelligent, he will realize that what? That if an individual is diligent in giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights, then he or she then therefore will be diligent about giving everybody else their rights. Now, whereas if you find an individual who is neglectful with regards to the rights of Allah, then you could not in any sense of sanity expect that they will be diligent in giving you your rights. If they don't give Allah his rights, why would you think they will give you your rights? Now, so for the one who is wise, he will realize that if we give Allah Ta'ala his rights and we're and we're vigilant about giving Allah his rights and, and constant upon giving Allah his rights, then everything else in our lives will fall into place. Everything else in our lives will fall into place. Now, so An Mu'ad bin Jabal, Rabbi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, he said that verily Mu'ad ibn Jabal He said that verily I was riding upon a donkey with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith has many benefits in it. Many, many benefits in this hadith. From the benefits of this hadith, it shows the permissibility of two people riding on a donkey. It shows the permissibility of two people riding on a donkey. Now, and when one were to examine yani, the deen of Al-Islam, he will find that it is a deen that is so complete, it is so perfect. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam wa sunnah. It is a deen that is so comprehensive. We have guidance for everything. If a person comes and says, is it permissible to ride two people on an animal, to ride two people on a donkey and the like? We say, nah, it's permissible. What's the proof? This hadith right here. That, that Mu'ad, Rabbi Allah Ta'ala, and was riding on a donkey with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which shows you the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the messenger of Allah. And he allowing his companions to ride upon a donkey with him. Naam. To show what? The, the, the closeness we should have in our relationships as brothers. Naam. The closeness the sisters should have as their relationship with sisters amongst yeah, one another. That we should be close because what? Because we're kin. Naam, we're kin. And the minuna ikhwa. The Prophet uh, Allah Ta'ala says that verily the believers are brothers. Naam, we are brothers. Ala kulli hal. In this time now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he always took advantage of every opportunity to teach the Sahaba to point them to good, to educate them. Every opportunity to make sure he was benefiting the Sahaba. Naam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, فَقَالْ يَا Mu'ad, He said, O oh, Mu'ad, أَتَدْرِي مَا حَقُّ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ وَمَا حَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ He said, O oh, Mu'ad, do you know what is the right of Allah upon the slaves? And what is the right of the slaves upon Allah? Now this was education through questions and answers. Now, which is an extremely beneficial means of educating. 
extremely beneficial. And this is that which we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, so, so, so for those who are interested and enthusiasts with regards to the methodologies of education and so on and so forth, then we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the, was the best educator, the best example of how to educate. It wasn't always one way. Some ways it will be in, 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 in lectures that rattle the heart, cause the eyes to tear, so on and so forth. Now, other times it will be calm. Other times it will be through questions and answers and so on and so forth. One of the benefits of questions and answers is that it, 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 it brings, yani, it wakes the mind up. Now you're extremely attentive because you're being posed a question. So now you're fully paying attention. Now, and this was a subject matter that yani, is just that important that it requires full attention. It requires full attention. So what was the, the most appropriate way at this particular time to grab that full attention? Now, so that this, in very, this valuable and very important lesson could be given is that the Prophet said, so let me ask him a question. He said, oh Mu'ad, do you know what is the right of Allah upon the slave and what is the right of the slave upon Allah? So Mu'ad, he said, فَقُلْتُ Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. So Mu'ad, he said, so I said, Allah and his messenger knows best. Ma'am, Allah and his messenger knows best. Which shows you that what? That if we don't know the answer to something, then our response should be, Allahu a'lam. Allah knows best. I don't know. Allah knows best. Ma'am. And that this is from ilm. This is from ilm. And we know that Mu'ad, radiallahu ta'ala, he was from the most knowledgeable of the companions. He was one of the most knowledgeable of the companions. The Prophet, sallallahu sent him to Yemen to teach. He sent him to Yemen to teach, which shows you that he was an individual who had an extremely high amount of knowledge. He had a very high level, knowledge-wise, right? But even with that level and the like, if he didn't know, he didn't know. So he would say, Allahu A'lam. Yeah? So when the Prophet said, let me ask him this question, he didn't know the answer. He said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam. Allah as messenger knows best. فَقَالَ yeah? النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, حَقُّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا the Prophet وسلم, he said what means, he said, and the right of Allah upon the slaves is that they worship him alone and they don't associate any partners with him. Now, that they worship him and don't associate any partners with him. They worship him alone without associating any partners with him. This is the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon us. And this is the kind of person we want to be married to. This is the kind of person that we want in our house. A person who's going to constantly remind us about Tawheed. A person who will study with us Tawheed, a person who will read with us through the books of it Tawheed, Kitab of Tawheed, Naam, Dalatul Usul, Kesru Shubahat, so on and so forth. The person Naam, who will be our study companion with regards to it Tawheed and be diligent, reminding us to purify our intentions and so on and so forth. This is what we want going on in our house because if Allah Ta'ala blesses us with children, this is the kind of spouses we want. A spouse that we know that the other one they're going to remind the children, teach the children about Tawheed. Teach the children that which will benefit them. Teach the children about Allah's right upon them and, 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 and instill within them and raise them upon being individuals who are striving to implement and striving to fulfill this right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon them. All of this helps for a healthy marriage. Naam. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Wa haqqul ibad ala Allah alla yu'adhib man la yushrik. He said, and the rights of the slave, the slaves upon Allah, is that Allah will not punish the one who does not associate partners with Allah. The one who does not associate partners with Allah, Allah Ta'ala will not punish them. Naam. Upon hearing this Mu'ad, he said, قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَفَلَا أُبَشِّرُ النَّاسِ He said, O Messenger of Allah, should I not inform the people? Should I not give them these glad tidings? Naam. Because what Mu'ad, he wanted to give good news to his brothers. He wanted to spread the good news to the Muslims. Naam. He wanted to spread khair, that which would make the Muslims happy. This is what Mu'ad wanted to do. This is a very important characteristic that, that, that will help us have ha happy marriages and help us have happy relationships. 
that we are individuals who love to spread good and cheerful news that which will make people happy. We love to spread this. Unlike how a lot of the individuals are, that they almost like take pleasure in, in being the bearer of bad news. They almost take pleasure in telling you something disturbing and so on and so forth. This was not how the Sahaba used to be. He wanted to give this glad tidings to the, to the people. Now, he wanted to share with them this khayr. So he asked the Prophet Sallallahu should I not inform mankind? Should I not tell the people about this? But Paul and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, due to his concern about the people, he told Mu'ad, La tu bashirhum. Do not give them this glad tidings. Do not give them this glad tidings. Why? Why don't give them this glad tidings? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Fayyat takilu. Don't give them this glad tidings. Why? Because they may become complacent. They may become complacent and then what? They don't work as hard. They may become complacent and then they don't work as hard. Them not working hard what is, it will jeopardize what? Will jeopardize their eligibility for a higher level in Jannah. Will jeopardize their eligibility for a higher level in Jannah. So the Prophet Sallallahu he wanted for the Muslims the best. He didn't want the Muslims to psych themselves out and then to yani, cheat themselves. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, do not inform them, why? Because then they may become complacent and they won't work harder. So what, if they don't work harder, then they won't, may not be eligible for a high level in Jannah. So for this reason, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, do not inform them. Do not inform them. Now, but it was understood, we understood, yani, to, to, to what extent, why the Prophet Sallallahu was telling, don't inform them. We understand this extent, right? So Mu'ad ibn Jabal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he kept this hadith to himself for a very, very, very long time. Now, and only because he feared dying, and it shows you that the Sahaba transmitted what they knew. There was no secret knowledge. Some people come and they try to make it seem like, no, there was some secret stuff that the Sahaba were upon, they didn't tell nobody else, right? This is not correct. Now, and the proof of that is that what? Is that before he died, he made sure that he narrated everything that he knew. Now, he made sure that he narrated all the khayr that he had with him, he made sure that it was there, now, and the like. So, he narrated this hadith out of fear of dying without informing the people of this hadith. Nah. So he narrated this hadith to them. Play it. And this was because he had a fear of hiding the knowledge. He had a fear of hiding the knowledge. Nah. It is a must that we safeguard that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to safeguard. Because if we were to do this, everything in our life will fall into place. Everything in our life will fall into place. This will help us in every aspect of our lives, and right now specifically, right, in our marriages. It will help us in our marriages. Now, now if we keep going back, what will help us into safeguarding the righteous so on and so forth is by what? By marrying what? A righteous person. By marrying a righteous person. So we should make things easy on ourselves. Don't make things difficult. Make things easier for yourself by marrying one who is righteous. The Prophet Sallallahu said in the famous hadith, the hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and Huma. And at this point, Abdullah ibn Abbas will show you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was very concerned about the state of the Muslims. He was very concerned about educating the Muslims. He did not differentiate yani, between the Muslims for any reason, for any reason. Because we have this one hadith now with Mu'ad. Ibn Jabal on the back of the, the donkey with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught him this tremendous lesson. Now, we have another hadith here where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he's teaching Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and Abdullah ibn Abbas at this particular point radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he was what? He was a child. He was a child. And the proof of how we know he was a child was that the Prophet Sallallahu he said to him in the beginning of the hadith, Ya Ghulam, inni u'alimika kalimat. He said, oh young man, oh young boy, oh small boy, I'm going to teach you some words. I'm going to teach you some words. Now, and it shows you what? That the Prophet Sallallahu he did not neglect anyone. He didn't say, oh, this is a little kid, let him play, forget it. Huh? He didn't say, little kid, why waste my time? He's not going to understand. You understand what I mean? He didn't say that. A lot of us sometimes, 
we, 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 we underestimate the intellectual levels of the children. We say, no, they're little, they can't handle this stuff. There's too much for them to handle. No, subhanAllah, teach the children. Now, you'd be surprised at their capacity. A lot of times we cheat them because we, 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 yeah, and we treat them like, 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 like they don't understand. We treat them like they're foolish, and then we get mad when they act foolish. Now, teach them, teach them how to be responsible. Teach them how to utilize the intellect. Work their brains. Now, work their brains. Work their brains with khair, not with Pokemon, not with Digimon, not with I don't know whatever these people is doing. Don't don't work their brain with that. Work their brain with khair. Layer. So the Prophet said, I mean, I want you to listen to what he told this young man. I want you to listen to the advice he told this young man. This is some heavy advice right now. This ain't like, you know, people say, well, you know, bring it down, dumb it down to their level. Listen to the advice the Prophet gave this young man. The Prophet said, he said, He said, preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve, and Allah will preserve you. Preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve, and Allah will preserve you. If you didn't know he was talking to a young man, right? If you didn't know he was talking to a young boy, you would think what? He was talking to a grown adult, one of the elders, telling this type of advice. Preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve, and he will preserve you. Which shows you, I didn't say that a lot, which shows you that the Prophet Sallallahu he what? He did not underestimate the intellectual level of Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala in Huma. But he spoke to him and he gave him a, a very tremendous lesson. So he said, oh young man, preserve what Allah has commanded you to preserve and Allah will preserve you. Preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve and you will find Allah in front of you. If you ask, ask Allah. And if you ask, ask Allah. And if you seek help and assistance, then seek the help and assistance of Allah. To the end of the hadith. Hadith Rawahu at Tirmidhi wa Hadith al Hasan al Sahih. Naam. So call al Alama so we can understand now, get some more understanding on what does it mean to preserve that which Allah has commanded us to preserve. So call al Alama Imam Muhammad bin Salih or Thameen, Rahimullah Ta'ala. That what is meant by Ahmadullah Yahfabka. That preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve, and Allah yani, will preserve you. Yani, then preserve the limits. Preserve the limits. And preserve the legislation, his legislation. To preserve his limits and his legislation. How we preserve his limits and his legislation? Why? How? Meaning the limits that he has set upon us. The limits he has set upon us. And the legislation that he has. Uh, place upon us. How do we do that? The Shaykh says, by staying away from, or by acting, excuse me, by acting and fulfilling those commandments in which he has commanded us with, and by staying away from those things which he has prohibited us from doing. So we, put, we fulfill the commands and stay away from that which Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to stay away from, then this will be how we are preserving that which Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to, pre to preserve. And if we do this, listen now, this is why we have to huh, do these things. This is why we have to marry people who's gonna help us do these things, who's gonna help our children and educate our children upon doing these things. This is why doing these things is too, 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 too important for us. If we do this, the Shaykh, he says, يَحْفَظْكَ فِي دِينِكْ وَأَهْلِكْ وَمَالِكْ وَنَفْسِكْ that if you were to do this, then Allah will preserve you in your religion. Right? He will preserve you in your family, in your wealth, and in yourself. Naam. The fact that Allah will preserve you in your religion, in your family, your wealth, and yourself. Do you need anything else? Would you need anything else after that? Huh? Allah preserving your deen for you, your family, your wealth, yourself. Every, everything is covered. All bases are covered. Sahwan in that. All bases are covered. Naam. Because good leads to good. Khair leads to khair. And this is why it's important that we marry individuals who will help us do good. This is why it's important that we renew right, our relationships, we renew our relationships. We ain't talking about like the kufar to renew your vows. We don't, we don't know nothing about that, ma'am. 
but we're talking about what renewing the relationship, making sure that the, that the foundation of that relationship is based upon taqwa, that the foundation of that relationship is based upon loving each other for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make sure that we're helping one another to preserve that which Allah ta'ala has commanded that we preserve, because if we do that, then Allah will preserve us. Naam. And then the statement, Ihfadillah, Tajidhu Tujahak, preserve that which Allah has commanded you to preserve, and, and you will find him in, in front of you. He said that you meaning that you will find yani, Allah in front of you, pointing you to every good, to every good. That Allah, not just yani, you will find yani, uh, Allah in front of you pointing you to every good, that right there is good enough, right? That right there is good enough, but also it gets better. And also that Allah Ta'ala will, uh, will bring you close, to, will bring you near to Him, right? And He will guide you to Him, will bring you near to Him and guide you to Him. Now, now if we had this, is there anything we'll be missing? Not a single thing. Not a single thing. Right? Not a single thing. So it is a must and it is incumbent that we have our relationships and everything built upon this. Naam. And we have to be patient with one another. We have to be patient with one another. And we have to understand that human beings are going to disagree with you. And that human beings are going to not to see things eye to eye. Naam. So, of course, there are going to be conflicts between the family members, conflicts between the spouses, conflicts between the children, and so on and so forth. But one thing, one advice I want to give with regards to this is that to be very careful over what you say. Be very careful over what you say and what you respond to. As the poet, he says, مَا كُلُّ نُطْقٍ لَهُ جَوَابٌ جَوَابٌ مَا يَكْرَهُ السُّكُوتُ he says, not every statement has an answer. Not every statement, meaning, not every statement deserves a response. Not every statement deserves a response. We're human beings. Sometimes the husband, he may say something that he shouldn't have said to the wife. Sometimes he may say it in a way that he shouldn't have said it. Now, but not every statement re requires a response. Likewise, sometimes the wife may say something to the husband that she shouldn't say. She may speak to him in a manner that she shouldn't be speaking to him in. Now, but it's not for the man to what? To be responding to every single thing. Some things, you let it go. Some things, you, you overlook it. Now, not every statement requires a response. And the sheikh, or the, the poet, he says, and the, and the response, and we put in parentheses, at times. So, you know, because sometimes you, you have to say something, right? So you have to be able to, to understand when, this, when, when to say something, not to say something. But those times that doesn't necessitate that you that 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 that, that you respond, huh? the answer at those times is what for the, to that which you don't like is just that you be quiet. It's just that you be quiet. Now, so we have to strive to remember this in our relationships to be gentle and ease with one another, to be forgiving to one another, to overlook one another's. Uh, shortcomings as we want them to overlook our shortcomings. Nah? To overlook one of the shortcomings as we want them to overlook our shortcomings. And as far as the women, I want to give you some advice with uh, Ta'ala that is particular to you and is from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Sahahahu Al-Imam Al-Libani Rahimahullahu Ta'ala Al-Imam Al-Libani Rahimahullahu Ta'ala he has graded as being authentic and Abi Hurairah Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu on the authority of Abu Hurairah, on the Allah Ta'ala and I want the women to listen up now. Because if you want to go to Jannah, I want you to listen up right now. Listen up. All the sisters who want to go to Jannah, listen up. If you don't want to go to Jannah, then may Allah guide you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِذَا صَلَتْ مَرْأَةَ خَمْسَهَا وَصَامَتْ شَهْرَهَا this is tremendous now. This is tremendous now. Make you should make you happy to be a woman. Really, you should be happy to be a woman. 
The Prophet said, he said, if a woman prays her five, if she prays her five prayers a day, a day, eh? and she fasts her month, meaning the month of Ramadan, and she safeguards and protects her private parts, and she obeys her husband, then she will be able to enter into any door of Jannah that she pleases. She'll be able to enter into any door of Jannah that she pleases. Now, whatever door of Jannah you want, enter through that door. But you have to pray your five, fast your mouth, protect your private parts, and obey your husband. Now, so this is a tremendous advice to the sisters, a tremendous advice to the sisters. And bismillah ta'ala, we would like to conclude by giving advice to the parents. By giving advice to the parents and giving advice to the husbands نعم, and the wives. Allah Ta'ala, he says in his noble book, teaching us a tremendous dua. Teaching us a tremendous dua. Because we know we understand not everything is what, not everything is always an ideal situation. Now, and sometimes you may have a good situation. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent you from making dua that it becomes better. That it becomes better. Naam. Ala kulli hal, you will find that dua, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the greatest means for us to attain that what we're looking for. And from the greatest means for us to yani, uh, be saved from that which we're fearing. Allah ta'ala, he says, رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنَ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا It says, O oh our Lord, make for us from our wives and from our progeny, from our offspring, those who are coolant of our eye, those who are coolant of our eye, and make us leaders for those who have taqwa. Make us leaders for those who have taqwa. Naam. This is a dua that is tremendous now. So if we're having any type of problems inside of our, 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 our families and our households in the night, then we should be reflecting now. Are we of those who are constantly making dua that Allah rectify our families, us and our families? Are we those who are making this dua specifically? Or oh Allah, make for us yani, our wives and our children, our offspring, coolants of our eyes. Make them coolants of our eye. Are we, are we making this dua? If not, we should be. You can find this dua. Naam. It's in Surah Al-Furqan, verse 74. So that's Al-Furqan, verse 74. Naam. Again, Surah Al-Furqan, verse 74. وقال إمام السعدي رحمه الله تعالى إمام السعدي رحمه الله تعالى says about this ayah. Naam. Ayah. أوصلنا يا ربنا إلى هذه الدرجة العالية. By making this dua, it means, Oh Allah, bring us to this level. Oh our Lord, bring us to this very high level. درجة الصديقين. Bring us to this level of those who are sincere. Bring us to this high level of those who are sincere. نعم. And this is important now what the Sheikh he mentioned. So I want you to pay very close attention. Because you will understand that yani, uh, ad'iya, dua, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for certain things, for yani, give us jannah, and so on and so forth, it, it is, is not something that you would just, is restricted to just your asking, but it necessitates something else. As the Shaykh is going to mention, he says, وَمِنَ الْمَعْلُومَ أَنَّ الدُّعَاءَ يَبْلُ الدُّعَاءَ بِبَلُوغِ الشَّيْءِ نعم, that the dua to read something, Naam, that the dua, that the dua you're asking Allah to reach something. Naam, the belug shay dua bi ma la yatim illa bihi is a dua that is not complete except that it has with it another component. Is a dua that's not complete except that it has another component. The meaning that it is not just you asking, Oh Allah, make our wives and our children and our offspring coolness of our eye and make us imams for the for the people who have taqwa, that you're not just going to ask that, and then that's it. But it has another element to it. It has another element to it. So the shaykh, he goes on and he explains. He says, هذه الدرجة, درجة الإمامة في الدين, 
He said, because this level of being imams in the deen, this level of being leaders in the deen, he said, then this is a level that is not attained, is not completed except with sabr, except with yaqeen. So if we want to see this dua in our lives, then we not only have to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then we also have to take the means. We also have to take the means for the attainment of this, uh, of the benefits of this dua. And what are the means? The means is patience and certainty. Patience and certainty. In order to be certain, right, to have that certain iman, then we have to study. We have to have ilm. We have to have ends. We have to study. We have those of you who are seeking to study and to benefit ourselves and benefit our time by studying and then implementing that knowledge in which we know. The proof of this is that it requires patience and it requires uh, uh, certainty is Allah Ta'ala's statement, And we made them imams. We made them leaders. Naam. We made them leaders. Yahduna bi amrina. Who used to yani, be upon, you used to call to, be upon the guidance of our of our commands. Naam. Or that they would got, yani, uh, how would you say? They will guide in accordance to our commands. Naam. But when did they attain this? When when were they made imams? When were they made imams that were guiding according to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah ta'ala says, Lemma sabaru wa kanu bi ayatina yuqinun. Only once they were patient and with regards to our ayat, they were certain. Only once they were patient and certain with regards to our ayat. Then at that point, well, then they were made imams. So to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, for, for, to make for us our wives and our children and offspring a coolant of our eyes and make us imams for those yani, who have taqwa, to ask this, we have to be coming with the sabr and the yaqeen in order to reach it. Without sabr and yaqeen, we're not going to reach that. We're not going to be the, from the, the imma of those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala kulli hal, Imam Sa'adi, rahimullah ta'ala, he goes on and he says, Qultu, fahadha dua He says, so therefore I'm saying, this dua, it necessitates, yastalzimu min al-a'mal musabar wal-ilm. He says, so therefore, this dua necessitates actions, righteous good deeds. It necessitates patience. It necessitates the knowledge. Knowledge that will bring its companion to the level of certainty. Knowledge which will bring its companion to the level of certainty. So therefore, if we want to see an enrichment in our lives, in enrichment in our family situations, in enrichment in the whole of our uh, existence, then we have to be of those who are taking to knowledge, those who are serious about knowledge and studying and benefiting ourselves, those who are even more so serious about implementing that knowledge in which we are upon, those who are striving to fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are striving to stay away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded to stay away from, those who are treading upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who are upon the way of the salaf, those who are striving their best to do their best, those who make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they find themselves coming up with less. This is what I wanted to remind myself and you all with. فنكتفي بهذا القدر وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين